The next uh, volume, in fact, which is a part of this uh, fair, uh, this gathering, is uh, the uh, volume on Stephanitis and Nihilatis, originally translated uh, by Alison Noble, with uh, the uh, uh, help of uh, myself and uh, Richard Greenfield. <clears throat> now, the tagline of uh, Fables of the Courtney Mediterranean is a little more, uh, I want to say, generic, but it comes uh, in the heels of another uh, uh, volume, which is relevant. Uh, we published uh, before that the uh, uh, the fables on the Sopian style, of which the title I don't recall now. But uh, it is in the same league of uh, texts. <clears throat> now, this is a project uh, Richard uh, Greenfield and I inherited from uh, Alice Mary Talbot when she uh, left the job of the uh, editor of the Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library series. And that was one of the pending projects which had uh, started uh, some years ago. And eventually we decided that the text that was really interesting, I mean, not only interesting, but uh, one of the major uh, texts of the, uh, uh, the result of the interconnection of a number of uh, cultures, starting from the Indian, <clears throat> going through the Persian one, the Arabic, Syria, if you like, and then the Byzantine one, to which I guess we got the text and rather inter in intermediate uh, 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 sources into the European literature. Uh, the original plan was to <clears throat> publish the translation of the eight uh, uh, first chapters, which we assume that there were the uh, a translation of Simeon Seath, an early one, 11th century translation. But uh, then when uh, Richard and I uh, took a look at the remainder of the text, which was published in 1889, the all 15th chapters by a certain Italian editor named Cuntoni, uh, thought that it's really, uh, it's really worth giving a try to uh, the full publication of the most extensive version of the text, which is the translation of the uh, Eugene of Palermo, the Evgenius of Palermo, uh, a later scholar, slightly later than Simon <clears throat> uh, which uh, has additional material translated from the Arabic uh, original and uh, gives a full fledge of the uh, stories that uh, were of uh, vast interest uh, to the people of the Mediterranean, I would say of the Eurasian world in general, starting from India going west and conquering the whole of Europe. So uh, the way it went, um, we uh, started uh, a close collaboration with uh, 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 Alison with uh, Dr. Noble, and I guess she might go on with uh, the uh, uh, greatest part of the uh, today's presentation. I myself focused on, focused on the uh, textual transmission of the text, and unfortunately, uh, it is really difficult for us to say, and for me at least as a uh, critical philologist, to say what part of the text belongs to the original a Simon Seath translation and what comes after as a, uh, a contribution or a reworking or whatever you like to call it, uh, version, later version of uh, a Eugenius of uh, Palermo. I owe much and we owe much in fact to the uh, work of Lobsterman who simply uh, treated a few of uh, uh, small poems and uh, rubrics attached to the main text, but he established a number of uh, uh, manuscripts as bearing major significance for the edition. 
the, addition, the text is based on an edition which cannot claim the progress uh, of a critical one, and still there's much work to be done. But at least uh, I myself was uh, principally uh, involved with the edition. I would say that the uh, French manuscript Supplementum Greco 692 is the best witness. <clears throat> and it's really funny because still, we don't know who is responsible for that, but I can give you one simple example of its superiority and the original level on which Simon Sith or Eugenius so of Palermo linguistically worked. There is a reading, just a reading, which is crucial. Uh, in a story in uh, which speaks about someone who dreams about uh, selling honey and uh, you know counting his uh, 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 eggs before they hatch, uh, there is a there is a two uh, word uh, insert which says I will become filthy rich, and the word is the, the uh, old manuscript said. Write Rizidon in Greek, Rizidon Afnios. And there's only one manuscript that uh, supplement Greek 692 of the Paris uh, Bibliothèque Nationale, which says Ridon, and that takes us back to Homer. So I suspect that this is one of the uh, tokens of the earliest. Uh, provenance of the, uh, this version of the text. And on the basis of this manuscript, we worked on uh, the uh, translation and the final sort of restoration in inverted commas of the text. So with not much ado, uh, beyond I would like to present uh, Dr. Aysa Noble, who interestingly enough is a doctoral student. She got her PhD under the guidance of the late Professor uh, Jordan. And she holds no uh, academic uh, appointment, but she is a, a tremendous translator and a uh, multilinguist, having translated uh, words from French, Spanish, Arabic, and Persian. And honestly, her translation in uh, Byzantine Greek uh, of Byzantine Greek into modern English, she gave especially Richard uh, uh, Greenfield uh, much fewer troubles than uh, other translations in our series. Sorry for my approach, but you see it's very technical <clears throat> and that of uh, someone who spends endless hours over pouring over you know, the minutiae of a text that has to be edited. So please, uh, Dr. Allison, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can everyone hear me and see me? Looks a bit yes. dark, actually. Yes, I'm just going to put another light on. In fact. Hopefully you can see me better now. Many thanks, Alex, for your kind words of introduction, and many thanks also for all your work on getting the volume ready for publication, because I could not, certainly not have done it without you. <laughs> you. And as you've um, intimated, it was um, a complicated manuscript tr tradition, and it needed someone with your expertise to try and sort it out. So many thanks to you and also to your um, co-editor in the Byzantine series of the DO DOML library, um, Richard Greenfield, who again was closely involved in getting the volume ready for publication. Um, and which this is the reason why both Alex and Richard's names appear on the front cover of the book, as well as inside as co-editors. Um, while I'm on the subject of thanks, I must also thank um, the late Robert Jordan for all of his help. He taught me Byzantine Greek and was always, always available for any questions on translations or text, always willing to help. And he's sorely missed by all his friends and colleagues. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Petros and the organizers of the festival for giving me this opportunity to talk about the book. Uh, during this brief presentation, I would like to briefly cover three areas, the development and transmission of the Stefanitis Keichnalatis text, uh, how the project to translate, to edit and translate it came about, and the contribution which I hope it has made to scholarship 
the subject. The, uh, the core of the work um, is from the Sanskrit Panchatantra, the five chapters, which according to legend history were brought back by the physician to the Sasanian king in the sixth century, who was called Borzuya or Pezue in Greek. And um, he translated them from Sanskrit into Middle Persian. He also then added another five chapters, mainly from Indian sources. And there are also two prologues connected with this version. One is his autobiography, in which he seeks spiritual and philosophical en enlightenment. And the other is an account of his um, mission to India. Uh, the stories are characterized by um, a, frame, a frame story uh, under which there are different narrative levels and sub stories. And this, this was kept throughout the work. The, the lessons are on how to conduct oneself to succeed in life. And in these stories, it is the clever who win, not the good. And the stories which he added from the Indian sources um, contain the same message. It's the clever who, who, who succeed in life. Middle Pers Persian version is lost, but it was translated into Old Syriac in the sixth century and into Arabic in the eighth century by Ibn al mukaffa who was a writer and translator, first at the Umayyad court and then at the Abbasid court. His version became very popular in the Arab world. There's over 140 manuscripts, I think, at the last count, all varying greatly between them. Um, there's still no critical edition because of all the variants and number of manuscripts. Uh, his Arabic was translated into Syriac, Hebrew, Medieval Spanish, Persian, and Greek. And the Greek version, um, well, there's several Greek versions. Uh, the first one was early 11th century from southern Italy or Sicily, um, only containing three episodes from the end of the work. In the late 11th century, Simeon Seath. Uh, translated or adapted the work from Arabic. He um, cut out all the prologues and uh, left out some of the chapters, left out some of the material within the chapters. He also added in biblical references, um, classical quotations, um, making it more palatable to a Byzantine audience. Um, by leaving out some of the stories, he also simplified the structure, which again made it um, I suppose, more, more acceptable. In the first half of the 12th century, there was another translation incorporating Simeon Seed's version, um, adding two more chapters and the rest of his unfinished chapter. Then in the late 12th century, uh, we have the Eugenian version, called so-called so because of the reference to Admiral Eugenius found in a group of manuscripts. Admiral Eugenius was a historical figure. He was a poet, administrator, translator, who worked for the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. He was trilingual in Arabic, Greek, and Latin, as we know from his other translations. And he added um, another preface coming before the three prologues and before the main body of the text, uh, which he commends the book and in which he's mentioned by name. So that's a brief, brief history of the text. Um, previous editions, Lars Olof Schjorberg edited Simeon Seath's version in 1962 and published it. And Vittorio Puntoni, as mentioned by Alex, published his edition of the full text in 1889. Um, Right, I'm just looking at the time. So moving on to the origins of the project. It was the subject of my PhD, which I finished in 2003, uh, which was entitled Prolegomena to, Recension, to an edition of the Eugenian Recension. And in this, I translated 
um, Seath's version as per Schulberg's edition. And I also looked at the other versions, in particular the Arabic versions. I had the misguided hope that I might be able to find the Arabic precursor to the Eugenian recension, or at least the, the group of Arabic manuscripts that might have been behind the Eugenian recension. Um, so I completed that in 2003. I then did nothing about it for a good 10 years. And then um, encouraged by Margaret Mullet, who's my supervisor for the PhD at Queen's in Belfast, I submitted a proposal to Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library um, for um, a volume on the Eugenian recension. And it was accepted by Alice Mary Talbot. There then followed a lot of delays and extensions. And I have to thank all at Dumbarton Oaks for their patience in bearing with me over this. Um, it took about, I suppose, six or seven years <laughs> to get it to publication. Um, thanks um, a lot to Alex and to Richard for getting it ready. The contribution which I hope it's made, it's a new edition of the Greek text containing all the chapters, prefaces and prologues. Not a critical edition, as Alex has mentioned. It uses four manuscripts. Um, I think it's, it's, it's the best we can do. And there's a facing page translation in what I hope is modern, modern readable English. And we hope it will appeal to a scholar and the interested general reader alike. And really to anyone who is interested in being entertained and instructed at the same time. So thank you.